So, yeah, so um, uh, I'm Ben. Um, I, sometimes I like to check, like, was anyone here born during or after 1990? 1990. Anyone? There's like at least one, two. Yeah, okay. So I was using the internet before you were born. <laughs> um, whoa, the fuck? <laughs> So, all right, thank you very much. Wait, question, uh, do questions? we have any questions? <laughs> questions for Ben. <laughs> okay, well. All right, slow down this time. <laughs> so, again, but slower? All right. Um, so, I do know something about fuzzing, um, but I did not know basically anything about Windows kernel. So, that's why this is for beginners. Because like that's where I was. I did like, all right, I've got five weeks. Pretty much I submitted. They said, yeah, sure, we'll take that. And I'm like, fuck. <laughs> so then I had to go and do all the work. Um, but if you've done a lot of fuzzing, then like each new target is just a new target. And so some of that I, I hope to put into the talk as to like how, how do you approach blind a new target and go and find stuff. Um, the little disclaimer just says that there are no bugs. Like, so if like a fuzzing talk with no bugs, like, oh, you're lame. You have no bugs. But in our modern climate, even if I did have bugs, there is no freaking way that I would have like a blue screen with like the addresses of the bugs I've found on the screen for you guys to like go and gank. Right? So let's let's just let's just pretend I've found bugs that I'm not telling you. Um, but in real life, I haven't found bugs. So before we, like, we're going to do it, like, in stages, right? First, we're going to talk about, like, some stuff about fuzzing. I always think that this is, like, super, super obvious, but it turns out every time I talk to people that haven't been fuzzing for, like, a long time, they just get shit wrong. Um, so what do we do when we're fuzzing, right? First, we find a good target. And that is hard. Finding a good target is difficult. It's like Goldilocks' bed, right? You want not too soft, not too hard, and you still want like a good result when you wake up. So you, 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 pick, you pick your target, and then you acquire essential knowledge. So if I'm going to fuzz the kernel, I'm not going to go all fucking psycho charge and learn everything about how everything in the kernel works, because that is not actually useful to me. Like, I need the knowledge that I need to deliver, but I do not need, like, five levels past that. Um, and then we have, like, what I call, like, the, the, the basics of fuzzing, right? So how do we deliver? What are our attack vectors that we can use to get tests to something in this code that we expect might be vulnerable? How do we instrument? Because if you fuzz and you don't know, like, if you're not instrumenting, then you fucked it up already. So fuzzing without instrumentation is really basically wanking. <laughs> if, if you don't have, before you start, a good plan for how am I going to know if it crashed? How am I going to capture the interesting crash state? How am I going to know for sure which of my tests caused that crash? How am I going to know that I didn't miss anything? then you need to go back and like, you know, like do a little more preparation before you get all excited. And my personal thing, which is not necessarily like an essential, is like scale. So if I can't scale it sideways by hardware, then I'm not interested. Because your only other option is to be smart, and that's more difficult. <laughs> so, some little tips like delivery, instrumentation, and case generation. If you're writing tools that do that, if you could keep them like entirely separate, that would be good for me, right? Because if, if I want to steal your stuff, then I might think, oh, you've got an awesome case generator. But if you've tied it into your whole entire framework, which is all written in frickin' Python, and I've got to like 
start hauling out the entrails just to get like the 200 lines of interesting code, then I'm like, oh, screw that. Whereas if you've got well separated, well, this is like software engineering actually, it's kind of embarrassing. If you've got well encapsulated tools, then I'm gonna have a much easier time when I go to like deploy them on my shit. So the better your tool chain, the faster you can retarget. Um, and like we'll talk about why that's important kind of now-ish. So this is a sort of an, an obvious equation. Um, I'm not very good at maths, but overall from a fuzzer, the number of bugs that you're gonna get is roughly equal to the probability of finding one bug multiplied by the number of tests that you send. Seems like, you know, really obvious, but it's a useful thought experiment. Like, I wouldn't recommend using it as a, the basis for a thesis, but as a basis for like thinking about stuff, it's good, right? So, can we change the probability of a bug? Well, no, probably not. Like, prob probably that's more or less fixed by how many bugs there are in the software. We can change the likelihood that we'll find it. We can try and tune that, right? We can make a smarter case generator. And that case generator might find more crashes in like target A than our first generator. So that's interesting. And a lot of people have taken that to psychotic extremes where they make like super smart generators, which are very, very slow. But in theory, they spit out like many more bugs. We can scale it sideways. We can say, right, well, yeah, fine, that's your chances on one box, so we'll just like run 300 boxes. That works. Um, lead time is important. So when I said before about rapid retargeting, like if you've got bad tools and if you don't know what you're doing, you, you pick a new target, it's gonna take you three or four weeks before you're even fuzzing. And all of that, in my view, three or four weeks, is that, that's cold cores for three or four weeks. You've just like wasted that. If you'd had better tools, then you would have delivered like 200 million tests in that time. Um, there's some getting better samples. I've actually talked this to death in other stuff and a lot of other people have done research, but it's worth looking into the samples that you're using for your fuzzer. Like you can just, you can just go and get a ton from the internet, but if you spend a little time, do a little code coverage, do some set reduction, blah, 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 you can get a much smaller set that has the same number of potential covered blocks and you'll find you'll have a, a better fuzzing experience. So this is all like the pre-fuzzing tool chain. Um, ways you could try and increase the probability of finding a bug. So this is kind of hard because like, I personally am like vehemently against the application of intelligence. Like I, I can see that there are people that do it and I can see that sometimes those people get good results, but I am horribly, horribly biased. But like imagine our being balanced. Um, this whole like feedback driven fuzzing, like we talk about like genetic algorithms and wank, wank, wank. Um, some people do well, you could look at it. Like if for example, you're very good at writing genetic algorithms, you could like have a go. There are for sure bugs that people have found using taxi. Um, <laughs> using those kinds of fuzzers that like a stupid fuzzer is never gonna hit. So clearly they've got some value. Uh, Microsoft have done very, very well out of Sage, which is like crazy ass awesome, but like I can't write that. And also it's very difficult if you don't have source code because of the way this SMT stuff, blah. Um, you could look at it, like people often go for this like fault injection, like they get obsessed about getting close to the vulnerable code and so they, they literally start like hooking around a function and saying well like, this is the function I think is going to be bad, so I'll instrument like just this bit of code and like start delivering front and back and it can work, like if you, first of all you've got to like suppose that you know where your bugs might be. And second of all, you've got to suppose that you know that your fuzzing is sensible. And then thirdly, you'll find a bug. It's like, whoo, all right, I win. But then it turns out that there's no actual way of reaching that function 
with that input from the outside world. So every time you find a cool bug, like I've found a gajillion awesome word bugs, if only I could, for example, get it to run untrusted VB components, right? Like I, I turned that stuff on for a while, I like did some fuzzing, I was like, hoo, hoo, hoo. But then like none, literally none are reachable. So it's like, well, I could have just like saved myself the trouble. Um, and the cor corpus distillation I talked about before, which is the, yeah, like the minimizing code coverage, but kind of. So let's go back to the equation and we'll realize that more broadly, the number of bugs is not an interesting number. Like I have a metric shit ton of like Microsoft Word bugs, but that's not like good for me. Like, having 200,000 or 500,000 doesn't make much difference. So you're like, okay, so are they useful bugs? And if they are, like, can we even find them? If we've got like half a million bugs, how do I find which are the ones I care about? And it turns out that is a deeply hard problem. So for a long time, you've had people talking about this like too many bugs problem, right? Like it's not the finding bugs that is difficult. It turns out that the hard part is isolating the good ones. But if you take that like a step further, it's like, well, what is useful? Everyone thinks like, oh, useful bugs, yeah. That's gonna be like a, a, like a static ideal, right? But it's not. Because it depends what I'm gonna do with it. If I want to sell it, then my utility metric is who's gonna buy this, right? If I'm Microsoft, my utility metric is I want to find bugs that I need to fix. If I'm like Tavaso, my utility metric is can I find 500 bugs and like make a big deal about how awesome I am. So whether or not you realize it, you're implementing your personal utility metric when you're running your fuzzes. And if you don't know what it is, then you can't necessarily like fuzz as well as you want. So when we talk about useful capability, right? So if, I, if, if I'm like dot shady government, like I'll probably want like a Java O day, right? Fine. And I might want like a backup Java O day for when my first Java O day gets burned. Fine. And I might want a spare backup Java O day just in case, you know, <laughs> shit goes wrong. But now we get to the point where you can't sell a freaking Java O day. Because all the government's like, um, yeah, we're, no, we're not really interested. Like, there's so much existing capability that they don't want to continue to acquire more. Um, oh, and like, will anyone buy it anyway? Like, can I sell it to like ZDI or whatever? CrowdStrike. Um, so we'll, now, 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 we'll, now we'll attempt to learn some stuff, briefly. Um, I do not want to do one of those talks where I'm like, hey, here's some diagrams about the Windows kernel I found on the internet. So this is all simplified. A lot of it is wrong. <laughs> if you see the guy in the pink shirt, like, looking worried, it's like, probably because I've screwed something up. Um, I'm going to assert that any, any mistakes I made are deliberate just so I could make it easier for you to understand and I've got like otters. Um, if you want to really learn about it, anything by Alex or Tajay, Juru is not here. Um, the guys that like wrote the serious books who are also as well as Alex, but uh, Probit actually, if you like search that guy and look for some of his PowerPoint presentations, some of those are radical, like they're awesome. Um, you can download this like Windows CRK, which is like a six month academic course uh, written for like either undergrad or postgrad uni students. That's really good. You can go through it in like a couple of days. Um, <laughs> and they had this like Wind Windows resource kernel, uh, which is not publicly available except like a little bit of Googling and you can like download the whole thing. There's some guy in Japan that like forgot that he had like directory listing on. <laughs> and you can get like a full VM that's like made to compile this new kernel. It's got like the, it's got sources for the entire kernel, obviously not the, the real kernel that they run. 
Um, but that is another freaking awesome resource. So if you really want to learn, then I'd go here. But otherwise, you get like the 10 minute version. Um, so this is like. <laughs> Let's, let's, not, let's not go into like, you know, memory layout, because that's like complicated. But so what you're supposed to do is from user land, we want to get into kernel. You're supposed to talk to something like kernel32.dll, and then it's supposed to talk to something like ntdll.dll, which is like the internal version. And then the nt executive makes stuff happen. Right, so through, we're gonna talk to nt executive via these like broker DLLs. And then shit happens, and then stuff talks to hardware. Um, in a little bit more detail, the way that works is, so this little dotted line is the user land kernel barrier. And how we get across that is we make a system call. Um, to do that in, on the user land side, we set up the arguments for our call. Uh, there's a number that identifies the system call, like what we're asking the executive to do. And then we make like a special call. And that special call like puts our processor into magic mode. Um, at that point, the NT executive works out what we're trying to do and works out which driver it thinks should do that, roughly, give or take. Um, so now let's get like complicated on you guys, right? <laughs> let's, let's get into some like really tricky stuff. So the, the subsystems I'll talk about like that are relevant for me are uh, IO, user, and GDI. There are a whole bunch of other subsystems, but they're really boring. Um, and then there's like, you know, more stuff that goes on. So IO is probably the subsystem that does a lot of the heavy lifting. Like if you want to talk to a driver in general, then you'd be going through the IO subsystem. Um, all you really need to know is that you make a system call, it like sends stuff to drivers. Drivers in Windows are layered, uh, which is important to know. So you have like this sort of driver stack, um, and stuff, get, stuff will get handled by your top level driver, and then lower and lower and lower until you eventually get like what's called a bus driver, which is the guy that's talking to an actual piece of hardware. Like somewhere in here you would normally see what's called the HAL, but that's like a red herring. Oh, this is like, so this is Barry the Colonel Otter. I think all like deep facts should best be imparted by otters. So Windows I.O. is like crazy async. It was designed that way bajillion years ago. Like Linux now is like crawling its way up to being truly async, whereas Windows has just like been there forever. Um, it uses these I.O. request packets. So everything you do with Windows I.O. is inherently async. They can be delayed, they can be sent back, they can be completed, they can have callback routines, blah, 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 blah. Um, there's like oops, and I don't have a diagram of one. Um, filter drivers is important. Like all drivers in Windows can have a filter. So this is the way every AV in the world works, right? So say you write an antivirus, you're gonna like have some kind of file system driver and you'll filter that. So your AV will use a filter driver to say like, okay, you're trying to read from the file system, wait, let me help you. Um, so now let's talk about some of the, in, like I, Like, IO for me is like not a super interesting subsystem. Like, I'll talk about why later. Like, a lot of people have done a lot of work on it. So, user 32 is a more interesting subsystem, but unfortunately, it's already like been heavily raped by Tajay and Alex and a bunch of other people. Um, and so, user does the GUI, right? So, anything that's like looks it's like if you're familiar with like Unix, then like, you know, it would be like X, right? Draws windows, does menus, does curses and all that kind of crap. Um, GDI, the, the third interesting subsystem. 
um, GDI is now where we're starting to get like, ooh, I like this. So like, this is about like, you know, day four when I'm reading through documentation, I'm like, ooh, ooh, this looks good. What does it do? So it draws stuff. Like GDI is the graphics driver interface, but if you just think about it as like a freaking toddler, like it just goes around drawing on stuff, right? And you can tell it where to draw, like draw stuff on the fridge. <laughs> draw stuff on the wall, okay. Um, and it handles stuff like bitmaps, fonts, metafiles, whatever. So an arguably questionable decision that they made around NT4 uh, was to move this whole lot into kernel space. Because they were like, okay, well, but we're drawing stuff, but like between like the user saying I want to draw stuff and the kernel like painting stuff to the screen, like we've got to do a context switch, right? We've got to do one of those crossing the dotted line things that we saw before, and that's slow. So they oh, we'll just put it in the kernel. Um, and they said in the documentation, like, but this won't affect the security of the system because all we're doing is like moving existing code from user into kernel, right? So like, like, why, would that affect our, <laughs> why would that affect our C2 rating? Um, and it turns out that both of those guys are actually like handled by one driver called win32k.sys. So if you're interested in kernel fuzzing, then win32k is your friend. It is your happy place. So there we go. <laughs> So now we understand all about the Windows kernel, and it only took like uh, five minutes. I don't see why these guys like spend time at a university. <laughs> so there we go. Um, you go through, we're talking about like now, how do we get there? How do we like deliver shit so that we can make stuff break? We can do what we're supposed to do. We can come down through like the regular API. Kernel 32 talks to, there's like five others at least of these like behind drivers that you're supposed to talk to. We can come up through hardware. So we can make the machine process an ethernet packet. We can make the machine process a Wi-Fi packet. We can make it like deal with a USB device. Like that's another way to get straight to the kernel pretty much. And finally, there's nothing magic about syscalls. Like, we don't have to go through the special stuff. Um, we can just do that process that we talked about before manually and just, like, literally make a, a direct syscall. It's just there'll be a lot of state and horrible, boring details that usually the, the driver would, like, sorry, the dealer would do for us that we would have to do ourselves or not. Um, the other thing we could do is, like, we could do this. We can put some kind of hook, like back in the old days, like when rootkits were easy, you could like just have an SS, like system call descriptor table hook, SSD, D, S, S, taxi, <coughs> SSDT hook, right? And it would like divert your syscall and like do something horrible with it. Uh, we could hook between like the executive and the whole IO subsystem. So that way we would get access to any kind of packet, like any ERP that's going to any driver or if we knew what driver we wanted particularly to target, then we could like write a, a filter driver that's specific to that guy. So if we want to break McAfee, then we can write a filter driver for their filter driver. So, right, so Matt Miller gave this like really good talk at Breakpoint about bug taxonomy. And I've got a much simpler bug taxonomy um, which takes me one slide, whereas it took him like a whole presentation. Um, you've basically got roughly three kinds of bugs that are kind of interesting. You've got local locals. So this is a local bug that you use once you're already on the system. Um, they're much more common, well, no. <laughs> uh, they're much more interesting than they used to be. Because before, like, no one gave a crap about Privesk on Windows, because it was just assumed that, like, you've got anything on a Windows box, you've automatically got, like, local system. Um, now we've got a lot of people writing sandboxes in their user land code, and we've also got the Windows code itself being much, much more robust. So suddenly we, we all care about like local privesque, but it's like a class of bug. You can't do anything with it, well, by itself. Like you need some way to get on there, like in the first place. 
There's remote remote, which like when I was at with these guys, like those were the bugs. Like anything that wasn't like remote remote was boring, right? These are like remotely triggerable vulns. So like a remote vuln in IIS that like gives you full control of the system. And that used to be fantastic. Except nowadays, when you want to like own someone, you don't really want to own like a random server on the internet. You don't want to own an IP address. What you really want to do is own a specific person. And the chances are that person is behind some kind of firewall and you won't have IP visibility of your target. So a remote remote is now not so cool. Because if I just like, want to spray shit around, then fine. But if I need a targeted attack, then they're less suitable than the last ones, which are remote locals, um, which are the kinds of things you would deliver by, say, a web link, or an email, or a Word document, or a PDF, or any one of a bajillion ways. And so those guys have come from relative obscurity to now being like the bug you want. Like if you're, if you're looking at the bugs that people want to buy, then that's kind of where they are. So, easy taxonomy. So let's look at the attack vectors that we just discussed, right? And like look at them in terms of where we're gonna go. If we come up from hardware, like if we're like doing USB or Wi-Fi or whatever, we're gonna get probably a remote remote. Um, RDP is a great example of this, but also SMB, bugs in the TCP IP driver. But now aren't we like, we're hardware specific, we're gonna find a bug in like some ethernet card, and like now I've gotta know all about that card. We've got reliability issues, like if I fail on this, like the machine's gonna blue screen, right? The dude's gonna notice. They'll be like, huh, that doesn't usually happen. Um, and they become like, you know, kind of a pain in the ass. You, if you want to use them in like production, if you want to weaponize them, then you've got to do a ton of work. So I was like, nah, not really. Or we can do this like SSDT hooks and the filter drivers and the stuff. Um, it's interesting, kind of, but like, why do I want to find AV bugs? Like, who gives a crap about those guys? Like, if you're installing AV, you're automatically like kind of thick anyway. So do we, do we want to own your machine? And you can't write drivers in Ruby. So that was like, you know, that's a showstopper right there. Um, GDI, though, is nice. Like, remote locals are good. Uh, because GDI, you've got stuff like fonts, you can embed those in web pages. What a great feature. Curses, hey, you can embed those in web pages. That's a great feature. Like, we love the internet, right? Uh, bitmaps, hey, you can put those in web pages. Oh, PNGs, you can put those in web pages. Or emails, or Word docs. Syscalls, I like, just because like they were easy to do. User, like, so the user subsystem is the last one that's left. Like, GDI looks good. User, do we want it? It's already been, like, kind of raped. Um, the keyboard stuff looked really good, except after Stuxnet, like, Microsoft went and, like, full triaged back, all the way back to XP to say, like, all right, you can only load one of those from System32. And if you've got access to System32 on a Windows box, then you don't need, really, to be tricky. Um, one of the things I did, but like when I, I started, like, I think I got this from like a, a Brett talk. One of, one of the first things you do if you want to like start looking for new bugs in something is you look at all the old bugs in the same thing, right? Like, well, so what's happened in the past? And so I'm going through all the kernel bugs I can find for the last couple of years, and I'm like, ah, user land, like user subsystem, eh, tarje, user subsystem, tarje, callback, tarje. Uh, like insecure, like DLL path, those will be fished out soon. All the good ones turn out probably to be in GDI. So Barry says, let's hit GDI, and I agree. Oh, really? Whew. <coughs> I'll be accelerating slightly. Um, so what have I got? 
like I've got some like you know actual vectors. We can do fonts. I can do any kind of font, TTF, OTF, dot font, but pretty kind of any kind of font that Windows recognizes. Cursors are cool, not so much the bitmap, but the animated cursors, like that can do stuff. Uh, and I know that fuzzer has like made stuff go weird. Metafiles are great, uh, because a metafile covers a lot of surface that you wouldn't otherwise cover. Images, I was like, Turns out you can like do JPEG and PNG in the kernel. Makes total sense. Why would you not do that? <laughs> like, these are simple formats. We should like parse them as quickly as possible. So we'll start off with fonts. So fonts are tricky, right? The idea of a true type or a scalable font is that it looks the same at any size. So it's describing the letter A in terms of a whole bunch of wacky curves and equations such that you can scale it arbitrarily without just having like, okay, this is, this is like the bitmap of the font at six by eight. So anytime you've got anything scalable, scalable equals fun, like we're happy. And to, like, to fuzz them, I've got to be able to display them. So I'm like, all right, I need to know how to do this. And it turns out to be unbelievably hard, in my opinion. So it's a simple nine step process. Um, first of all, we add the font as a resource. So we take the file that the font is in and we tell the process that we're inside that that font kind of exists. I would suggest that it's a good idea to fix up the checksums. Like a, a TTF and an OTF both have, like they've got these internal tables and each table has a checksum and also the whole thing has a checksum. And anytime there's something that retarded that might reject one of your tests, then you may as well fix it because it takes no work. So if you want to know how to do that, then you like Google for this like magic value. You'll you'll find the spec, and then you can write your own checker. So if we've got a window in Windows, that needs a window callback. Like that's one of the stuff you have to do. So your your window object is going to receive a bunch of window messages. And you've got to have a callback for every message that you might receive, such as the callback will respond to whoever sent you the message in a correct way. If you want to like do it stupidly, which works, there is a default window proc. So this, this code is all in Ruby, but all of these are the Microsoft API names. So if you're choosing an inferior language, um, you, can, you can still use the same names in whatever your like thing is that lets you access the, the, the API. So you can just say, all right, if I get destroyed, then die. Otherwise, do whatever the default thing is. I don't really care. You can, you can put your logic in there, and like there's a lot of code that I've seen that does that. There's like a Russian um, font fuzzer, for example, that's just horribly written. They wrote it with their feet. Um, and they've got, like, everything's done by handling, like, WM paint messages. I don't think you have to, but, like, I don't really know about Windows. Um, so now you've got to make a window class. Like, we're getting object-oriented. Um, mainly you need your, your window proc. You tell it some stuff, and you get back what's called an atom. Um, Windows only has room for like 16 and a half thousand atoms or something for some reason. So if you don't clean up here, then your system will go horribly, horribly wrong. So I, I would suggest either like religiously cleaning up always or just using like one window class. Um, and so you register this class and now like, okay, I've got a class, I need an instance. Um, that's all fairly self-evident. You just say, like, basically, I want an instance of this atom, this, this class. And there are some things. You say, like, how big it's going to be and what kind of visibility and what kind of blah, 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 blah. So, so far, not so bad. Trouble with fonts is you don't know what the font face name is. Like, I want to make, like, a, a nasty font, right? And... I don't know what the name inside the font file is going to be, and I don't want to write like code that parses some C structs. The, this is an undocumented API. You can use this like get font resource info, where you pass it like the file name, 
And so now, like, GDI will, like, read the file, parse the font, and then extract the name for you. So, like, I don't know, but I reckon, like, stuff could already go wrong here. Like, there is some chance that, like, just by calling this API, like, stuff's going to blow up. I, I keep looking at Alex to see if he's nodding or shaking his head. But I reckon stuff, like, may even go wrong here. Um, but anyway, so it'll, it'll put the name of the font into a buffer. So this is, this is why, like, some of the code I looked at from the Black Hat um, 2012 EU talk, I'm like, why are you just using, like, one font? Why are you using, like, a hard-coded font face name? And it's because they didn't know how to do this. Um, whereas what I want is, like, to have, like, a thousand samples that I'm screwing with. So now we need to create the font. Uh, step six, shit's getting serious. Um, You've got to say, like, how big it is. Um, this is where you need the font face, and do I have animation on here? Oh, shit, don't die. Right, so yeah, this is where you need the font face, and you select it into the device context for your current window. And what's the device context, Barry? So basically, like, any logical bit of stuff would be a device context. It could be like a bit of the screen, like a bit of the, the physical screen. It could be a part of a printer. Um, it could be just like a, like seriously, like an abstract bit of memory. You can, you can do that as well for, like if you want to cache a rasterized bitmap, right? You would copy it into a, a DC just in memory. So think of them as like, you know, a chunk of stuff. And each DC has attributes, and among those are the font that is selected, or the brush that is selected, or if there's a transform, like make anything that's put into here to be like twice as big along X, but half as big along Y, and so on and so forth. Just a, a term you need to know. So now, all the stuff that like Windows does for you automatically, you never really think about until like, shit, I've got to do this myself. Like how big is a line of text? Well, I don't know, like, how many characters can I fit in this window before I need to, before I need to wrap? Um, and this is the API you need for that. Normally, you wouldn't use it. Like, there's, there's another API called Draw Text, which will do the wrapping for you, but Draw Text doesn't take as many options. So you can't pass the sneaky options to Draw Text. So you've got to do it the hard way, and if you do it the hard way, you've got to wrap it yourself. And then finally, like, at step nine, we can, like, actually put some text on the screen. So we're using uh, ext text out w. We select a device context, where we want to put stuff, this like special option, and such. Like some of this stuff is like, you know, for the internet. Like I, I don't expect that everyone can like instantly like parse this code and like, well, this is how I will run my stuff. So some of this is like for the record later. Um, so this magic ETO glyph index is cool. So this says that um, don't like, don't try and work out what glyph I mean. Just like literally go into the font and draw the glyph of the index I specify. Um, because otherwise, like Windows will start to do like language parsing to say like, well, you probably don't want like the Chinese character. You want this font, this glyph up here that's part of your your character set. It just stops you doing that. And yeah, that was horrible. So basically, that was the first week, give or take. And I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. Like, how can it be this hard to do like something that you would imagine to be simple? Like, I just wanted like some text to come up on the screen. Is that like such a horrible thing to ask? Um, so at at KiwiCon, um, I had some slides that were potentially slightly risque. Like, I like to be LGBT friendly, and so I thought that I would demonstrate that by, you know, like, having some lesbians on my slides. I mean, <laughs> what is wrong with that? But uh, apparently, like, you're not supposed to, like, present that the way I did. <laughs> <laughs> and so this year you will get Matthew Swish.
Detroit demo time. What are we doing? We're doing fonts, right? Yep. So what I'm doing is on my Unix box, I'm starting a thing that is making font test cases. And those go into a work queue. Anything in the work queue is picked up by actual workers. So normally I would have like 200 of these. Like for this like instance, we've got like one of them. So when I start the Windows worker, it'll hopefully start up and oh, fuck you. <laughs> oh, you son of a whore. This is the part everyone loves, right? This is like when the speaker's like on the stage, like, I'll just mess with my stuff and make my demo work. This is to do with the way I do crash detection. Um, if there's an unclear checkpoint, it assumes that like something has gone wrong. So the, the, the bit here is like the, all the checks I'm fixing, obviously. <laughs> I'm gonna do this one more time. Live demos for the win, right? That is the theory. Let me let me let me just restart that machine and we'll do that demo again later. So what happens is like sometimes when you when you run the fuzzer, um, it'll open a shared section, which is like user mat. Um, and because, like, so the file you're working on, the checkpoint file is like mapped in user and kernel, you can't ever delete it because it's like mapped and it's like weird. And so there's no way you can actually delete the file no matter what options you use until you restart the machine and it clears the link back from kernel. So let's pretend that that worked. It'll work next time. So curses, now, right, so we've done fonts. We, we've, we've, we've seen an imaginary demonstration. Um, holy fuck. And it was, it, it was entirely successful. So curses, I thought, oh, okay, this is gonna be like even worse. But turns out not, like this is more or less the whole thing. Like load cursor from file and the file name, and that's it. I was like, but why aren't I like screwing around with a device context and all this kind of like wacky shit. Um, it turns out there's, there's only one cursor. So the cursor operates like seriously on like a trust model. Like you're not supposed to mess with it unless it's in your window. Like, really? <laughs> That's it. Um, so all you need to do is once you clip it into your window, once you say like this is my cursor now, Yes, it puts the lotion on its skin. Then it'll change the cursor. Um, so let's see if our other machine is going to be nice to us yet. Maybe this time. Right, 
so this is like just a bunch of cursors I've got from the internet, some of which are animated and some of which are not. The ones where it's flickering is like it, it can't load those at all. And like mostly these are gonna look, you can see that some of them are broken, like clearly there's like horrible stuff that has happened to them. Um, so this is, this is the one I've had the, the best results with so far in terms of odd stuff happening. Stop. <laughs> Please stop. Stop now. OK, enough, enough. That's good. Good computer, yes. So metafiles, I'm conscious of the fact that I'm horrendously over time. Metafiles are awesome. So a GDI command is like going to be something like draw, draw this curve, draw this line, make this shit red, do, do something, right? And so it turns out that what a, a metafile is, like a Windows metafile or an EMF, is just a script of those. It's like a list of those commands, one after the other, in such a way that eventually by the end of it, it will have like drawn some horrible clip art of a palm tree. Um, like anything scalable, it's great. In like about 2002, 2003, I guess, they were awesome because they also had this thing which is like an abort procedure. So as part of your metafile, like as part of your picture, you could also say, oh, and by the way, if anything goes wrong while drawing this picture, maybe you could just run this code. <laughs> and so that was hilarious, but they kind of fixed that, sadly. But they're still fun because you can cover a lot of the other GDI surface with only one actual attack vector. Like if you make a really smart case generator, like you can deliver more or less any GDI command via one of these metafiles. So there's a special thing called an Aldus placeable metafile. It turns out the old metafile, the Windows metafile, doesn't have any scaling data. So it doesn't know how big to draw anything or where to put it. So if you've got like some little envelope, it doesn't know if you've got like a huge window that it should like make it bigger. So they made a non-standard standard, which was to use this APM header to provide that missing information. Um, so if it's got this like magic byte, it's one of them. So I'm like, okay, so I don't know, I don't want to read this APM header, that sounds hard. So how do I display a metafile? So I looked at MS Paint. If you use something like API Monitor, you can see the API calls it makes, and it turns out that what that does is use GDI Plus, which is the newer, safer C++ interface. Uh, it converts the metafile to a bitmap in user land, and then draws that, so that's not good, because like, we don't get a kernel attack surface. What I think I'm supposed to do is to, like, to parse the APM header, and then use this coordinate spaces and transforms API to set attributes on the device context that say, right, you've got to draw this twice as big and twice as high and use these like brushes. But that's like work. Okay. And also like I refuse to do anything to do with like pels and twips. Um, or you can just convert it to EMF, uh, which is an enhanced metafile, and an, an enhanced metafile has that scaling info. I don't know if I lost something by doing this, but it's easy. Um, so pretty much if you want to convert a met, like a WMF to an EMF, then it's this. And then like once again compared to fonts, super simple, like play enhanced metafile. <laughs> I think that might be my favorite, <laughs> actually. Yeah, so, so this one is like a little bit different. Like before I had a bunch of potential samples. Whereas here it's just, no, I haven't run this before, okay. So is this one, I just use like one just so it's like more obvious what's happening. So this is like this, the same little bit of stupid clip art. It's like some crayons, right? 
But you can see that just by like screwing with some of the GDI commands internal to the file, like some of the time like it doesn't display anything at all, and some of the time like really odd stuff happens to what is supposed to be the image. Um, this is another like potentially fruitful attack vector. Oh, this is like actually I had to like massively slow this down because um, otherwise it was like just too fast to see. Do you reckon I can do the font one and it might work? What do you reckon? If I can even st stop this one. Computer, what are you doing? Computer, stop. So when, when it's drawing the blank glyphs, um, I've told it to use this like uh, ETO glyph index, and there's just no, literally no glyph there. The ones where it's drawing everything are the ones where it's like, oh, this is like a blank glyph. You couldn't have meant that. You must mean like this other glyph. And it just runs through at a variety of sizes and a variety of like different, like I use like right to left reading. I use the raw mode, blah, 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 blah. And good. So now, like that was the easy stuff, right? And now I'm like, so I'm reading the documentation and I find this function on MSDN. Yeah, I've only got like another 20 slides, dude. Don't, don't panic. So I find this function on MSDN and it's like, uh, something about a JPEG or a PNG and like something about you're going to rasterize that for me in GDI, like in the kernel. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> and then like you read a bit more and it's like, oh, uh, it's like only for like actually printers. So you need like a printer device. And I was like, oh. Like, fine. I can be a printer. How's that hard, right? Um, and so this is like, let's skip some of this. Basically, the idea is you get your printer, you find out if your printer knows how to do JPEGs, but if you just use one of the built-in ones, they do. Uh, you fill out like the same normal bitmap struct, but you say like, this is a JPEG, and then that's it. All you gotta do is like to make the API call. Um, it's, it doesn't display anything to screen, but if it tells you, like, it's copied a number of scan lines, basically what it's done is it's taken your JPEG, it's gone into the kernel, bizarrely, converted that into a bitmap, and then in memory copied that into a printer device context, at which time something could potentially go wrong. Um, it would be the world's, like, worst demo because you literally don't see anything on screen, so I didn't even try to do one of those. Cool, and we're almost done. There's just like, while I was looking at the, the keyboard layouts, basically like Alex tricked me cruelly. He said, oh, you should look at keyboard layouts. I'm like, oh, okay, that's, a, well, Alex says it, he's, he's smart, that must be cool. So I went and looked at keyboard layouts, and like, okay, I would need to like make a system call, blah, 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 and I did all this work, and then it turns out it was like completely like, fixed. Um, so it was a massive, massive waste of time. But along the way, it's like, well, how would you make a system call from Ruby? Because, you know, you wouldn't want to write like C or anything. That would be like gay. <laughs> um, I've got the, this is the 64-bit version. Basically, on 64 and I guess ARM, um, whatever, like your first few arguments are in registers. So you copy those in. Uh, your next args are in stack then you just use, like, you build the rest of it as a string, like an assembly language string. You assemble it with 
Medasm, which is like a bunch of French people code. Um, usually I wouldn't touch it, but I don't want to write it myself. Um, and once you've got that, on, on x64, you need to go RWX because it tries to like clean up the stack afterwards. Uh, you just literally do create thread from your opcodes, like from a pointer to your code. It's like writing the world's easiest exploit, right? You get effectively shell code and you call create thread from that. Um, and it goes. And then you have like a one line syscall fuzzer. So what this will do is it'll just make a random x64 system call from anywhere from like one to hex 2000 with like six args of junk. Um, and that is the elegance of Ruby. Yes. You could not do that shit in Python. <laughs> Holy shit, someone else uses Ruby? <laughs> that is phenomenal. Um, so this, like, if I run this in real life, like, mostly it just, like, AVs the user land process that I run it from. Sometimes it, like, locks the screen or, like, moves the mouse around. So, like, stuff is going on. Um, it's obviously really, really retarded. Like, most of the system calls want, like, nested pointers to pointers to structures that cross-refer to other structures. So you would need, like, a more sophisticated case generator than, like, a random number. Um, but it works. So you can deliver that way. And some of the stuff that I said I was talk gonna talk about, I didn't talk about because I ran out of time. Um, if there's anything that you thought like from the like talk abstract that should have been here, then it's probably like there instead. Um, Right, this is like the, the props slide. This is like where like, I suck the dick of all the guys that like, told me stuff. It's like, you guys are awesome, I love you guys. Thank you, thank you, Alex. Thank you, Tajay. And we are done. We have like time for, I reckon like uh, 20 or 30 questions. What? Yeah, we definitely have time for 20 or 30. If you, if you can answer them as fast as your first presentation was earlier. <laughs> that would be awesome. But, uh, I think we'll have to hold questions uh, for Ben afterwards. I believe it's a one drink per question um, currency right now. Is that right? One, one drink per question. All right. Well, let's thank Ben, everybody.